the study of man. There are two great themes that we shall consider, both the origin and the nature of man. Now, as we've said, speculation concerning himself has been a subject that has engaged the intelligence of man from the very beginning. I'm of the opinion that all of us like to talk about ourselves. Someone has described a bore. A bore is a person who talks about himself and won't give you an opportunity to talk about yourself. That is a bore. And today we like to talk about ourselves. So this subject tonight, about the origin of the human family, about where we began, about our nature, how we are made. That is a subject that interests us, and certainly it's one that's very close to us. It's one that pertains to our very being. And tonight we are going to see that there are actually two theories, or let me put it like this. One is a theory of man, and it's called philosophy. And the other is not a theory, at least we believe it's the truth. It's the Word of God. Theory and truth. Theory is philosophy. And truth is the Word of God. And these two are diametrically opposed to each other. And I think we need to face that. Tonight, philosophy has attempted to find the origin of man in some other area, in some other place, than in a creation by a creator. And also, the philosophy of man disagrees, and not only disagrees, but is diametrically opposed to the Bible teaching on the nature of man. And we need to, I think, face up to that. Now tonight, I want us to discuss these two subjects. And first of all, we want to talk about the origin of man. Where did he begin? How did he begin? What do we know about the origin of man? As you know, there are several theories that are abroad today, and right now there are four theories that I believe would probably encompass the thinking of every person. And we want to look at them. The first one is naturalistic evolution. Naturalistic evolution, or if you want to call it biological evolution. Now, biological evolution has no place for creation. It has no place for God whatsoever. The thing that characterizes it is that it is godless. One of the reasons that it has been so popular, it has afforded man in the 20th century an explanation for the origin of man without having to admit God. And for that reason, evolution has been very popular indeed. And it, it's amazing that it is so popular. In fact, it is so popular tonight that everything in the schools today is taught from the evolutionary viewpoint. Granted that biological evolution is true, which I wouldn't admit for one second, but granted that it was true, it wouldn't explain everything. And you couldn't explain religion today, you couldn't explain history today, and there are many things that you could not explain, and yet everything. In other words, they've gone all out for the theory of evolution today. Now, actually, some of the theories that have been advanced are utterly ridiculous and preposterous today. One that has recently been advanced is that, and as you know, biological evolution has many problems. I wonder if you realize that. Biological evolution, for instance, has the gap theory. In other words, there are certain gaps in biological evolution that they cannot fill out. It creates a problem for them. They're not able today. And any honest evolutionist that is a scientist will tell you they do not know how to fill in. And they accept by theory that sometime in the future they will be able to fill that out. And that's the reason 
when you hear today, they say the missing link. Actually, there are many missing links, not just one. There are many in this theory of evolution. And they feel that somewhere along the line, they'll be able to fill that in. And they have recently, Dr. Louis Leakey, who is a 56-year-old Britain anthropologist, he claims that down in Tanganyika that he has found not the missing link, and yet these newspaper reporters always like to write it up like that, but he thinks he's been able to fill in one of these gaps, and he's found a skull that he calls the nutcracker skull because the teeth in it are so set and are in such good condition that the fellow could crack a nut, if you please. And the nut, I'm afraid, is the theory that is being advanced around this. And the amazing thing is they didn't find an entire skull. They only found part of a skull. Then another theory that came to light recently, you probably saw it. It was written up in quite a few magazines that a scientist, and again this was a British scientist, believes that the origin of life, and we'll see that in a few moments, that the origin of life is a real problem for them. I have several clippings where right now there is a whole crew of scientists that are working on this problem of how life originated. You see, it's one thing to trace back and say, this came from that and that came from the other thing, but where'd the other thing come from? You've got to go back to a place where you've got to start with life. And now, how did it begin? And that, for any honest evolutionist, he'll tell you, we haven't solved that problem yet, that we don't know how life begins. They have a whole crew today of scientists that are working in the field of theoretical science that are attempting to come forward with the answer to that particular problem. Now, this British scientist says that he believes that mankind came from seaweed. Now, he advances that as being really a sensible solution. So that when you go down to the beach now and you see some seaweed there, that may be your great-grandfather out sunning, you see. You never can tell. And you ought to be careful how you treat seaweed today because we could have come from seaweed. Now, if you think that's ridiculous, listen to this. I tuned in a television program during the summer on this matter of man in space, whether he's going to make it to the moon and the other planets or not. And this was a young scientist out of MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And this young scientist was trying to explain why they wanted to get to these other planets. And he gave this explanation. He said, we do not know how life began, but it looks as if it might have been plausible that millions of years ago that some prehistoric creature that was intelligent came to this earth and he just stopped off. He camped here for the night and he left his garbage can and man came out of the garbage can. Honestly, that's what this, I thought I'd tuned in a comedy program. Honestly, I was waiting for everybody to laugh. And I found out I was the only one laughing, that the man was serious. And he was saying that this is, now, that doesn't end at all. What we need to do is to get to some of these other planets and leave our garbage can. May I say to you, what audacity, what arrogance of man of thinking that he can go to a planet and propagate this race over again. I think we better leave man on this little earth and not let him track his sin all over God's universe. Here is enough, if you please. And he ought not to take it away from this earth. Now, those are actually theories that are put forth by intelligent folk today. Now, let me just say this word concerning naturalistic or biological evolution. The thing is that there have been other theories of the past that were in their day scientific and all intelligent men accepted them and there were those who said they contradicted the Bible. For instance, Ptolemaic science. That was a time when 
intelligent man. Help that. And I mean intelligent men, men like Augustine, men that for an IQ could top anything we have today. Now, those men accepted certain scientific views of the Ptolemaic theory, and my friend tonight, that theory has exploded and is out. No intelligent person tonight holds that. Then there was the Newtonian science that came in. And you will find that not only Newton, but other men of his day, intelligent men, help that theory. That theory is exploded tonight. And tonight, if you want to know the main reason that I would not accept biological evolution is that in the final analysis, it's merely a theory that attempts to explain the origin of life and especially of man, and it's the popular thing right now. And we're down in that trough today where you better go along with it. And it's always been, you're not intelligent if you don't follow this. Well, brother, I'll just have to appear not intelligent. I refuse to accept it because it happens to be popular today. It is a theory. It is not proven at all. Biological evolution is not a proven science at all. Now, there are certain things that they do know, and we're going to make reference to that. I want to make this statement right here. The reason that we as Christians reject biological evolution, and probably I should go down to that right away. Three reasons. First of all, we believe that biological evolution has no explanation from nothing to the inorganic. In other words, where did matter begin? Granted that you push this back billions of years, and may I say, I think you can. I honestly believe that this universe is far more vast as far as expanse and time is concerned. I believe that you can go back literally trillions of years. You see, we have a God of eternity, and he's an infinite God, and since he's not limited, but evolution must be able to come from nothing to matter. And they have no explanation for that at all. From nothing to the inorganic. And that is the only way that you can explain matter is by creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's the only logical explanation that there is tonight. Isn't that interesting? Biological evolution has no explanation from nothing to the inorganic, and therefore we reject it because uh, the Bible has the only record tonight that will explain from nothing to the inorganic. Second, from the inorganic to the organic, that's life. They have no explanation for the origin of life. Now, just to push it out there in the ocean, and make our ancestors seaweed millions of years ago hasn't answered anything at all, if you want to know the truth. You have not solved the problem at all. There are many questions you have not answered when you said that. You have not proven anything. And therefore, you will find that in the Word of God is the only explanation. God created man out of the dust of the earth, and he breathed into his breathing places the breath of life. That's the only explanation of life. Now, there is the third. From organic to man, God created the whales, God created the fish, God created the animals. But it's a separate creation, the creation of man. And there is no natural transition from the animal to man. The very fact that man has a chassis that's similar to an animal doesn't prove that he has the same origin. It merely proves that he moves in the same environment. We live in the same world that the animal lives in. And we, therefore, we have to have feet, we have to have a head, we have to have many things that the animal does, and the animal has to have many things than we do. But there's no such thing as bridging between man and animal. They've never been able to bridge that. 
and even the old Piltdown, you remember they found in Great Britain, was proved a forgery. How do you know tonight that the others are not forgery? How do you know tonight that these other so-called missing links, the Java man, how do you know that that's genuine? I asked years ago, the man that was at Fields Museum, you know, they have all that just set up there. It's all myth. It's fairy story, the story of the development of man. And we came to the Java man, and I asked him the question. I said, how do you know that he is not really a myth? He said, if you want to know the truth, we don't know. When you come down to facts, this is just something that's been reconstructed. And you see, when you start out with a certain thesis, it's amazing how you can fill it in. And that has been filled in, and there's no question but what there is development inside the phylum or inside the phyla, which is the large families. In other words, I'm of the opinion that all horses came from one horse. I'm of the opinion that probably all monkeys came from one monkey. But I don't think any of you came from a monkey. But there are certain great families and the development in the film. You can find that many, many places today. So that there is no transition here at all. Homo sapiens is a separate creation of God. Now, for these three reasons, we reject what is known as naturalistic or biological evolution. And I believe that Christians ought today to stand on their two feet and say they reject it and be able to give a reason why they reject it. And now we come to the second. May I say this is the most illogic view that anyone can have. It's theistic evolution. And it is held by some today who actually, if you want to know the truth, they would like to appear as belonging to the scientific crowd, and at the same time they would like to appear as a believer, and they have attempted to go with both. They are trying to run with the hare and the hounds, and they take the position that God created the amoeba to begin with, but from there on he went off and left the little amoeba, and it did its own developing. That's theistic evolution. Now, unfortunately, that has gotten into many of our schools. And you will find, in fact, so-called Christian schools. Because the average person not being able to distinguish, they have been able to worm their way in. And it's amazing how many places, I could tell you tonight, many places where you'd really be surprised to know where actually theistic evolution is being taught today as being the teaching of the Word of God. Now, I want to pass on from that because theistic evolution is very illogical. I do not believe that you can logically believe in theistic evolution. You are either going to accept the Bible account or you're going to reject the Bible account. I can understand how a man, an unbeliever, will reject the Bible account. I cannot understand how a so-called believer can say, I am a theistic evolutionist. Just impossible. You either believe the Bible or you don't believe the Bible. These are in conflict. And this idea today that you can reconcile them, well, it's a sad thing. Now, here's the thing that's dangerous to my judgment right now. What is known as progressive creationism. This is a viewpoint that is now, I would say, that 90% of our Christian schools are teaching progressive creationism. I'm giving you quotations from Dr. Ram, Dr. Bernard Ram. I knew him when he taught here at the Bible Institute, for I was teaching at the same time. He was at Baylor University. He's now out here at Covina. I consider him a friend. I think he's a fine Christian gentleman. He has, I think, very high principles. As far as I can tell, I've had a very cordial letter from him about our radio program. But I do not agree with him. He holds this viewpoint of progressive creationism. Several times in his book, he makes the statement that this is the view that he holds. It's called, and this is his definition, development from vacancy. And he takes the position that Genesis 1-2, 
does not refer to any kind of a cataclysm or catastrophe, but actually just speaks of a vacancy. That is, that God started off with a lot of raw material and that he developed by evolution, or you can call it something else if you want to. He uses the illustration of an artist that has a canvas and has the colors and all of that, and he starts painting. And that God first created all the materials, and then he took the materials and began to work them over. And after a few thousand years, a million years for that matter, he came out with man. That is the view, I think, generally speaking. From raw materials to finished product. Now, I grant you that there are today some very fine men that hold that viewpoint. I do not hold it. I cannot hold it today. I do not believe that a minister, probably in a school where you're not routed out as you'd be in a pastorate, you could hold a viewpoint like that. But where you're rubbing shoulders with humanity today, that would be a very difficult viewpoint to defend. It is known as creation or progressive creationism. And it is, as I've said, like the artist. And it was Higley who made the statement that he thought that progressive creationism is disguised theistic evolution. It's very close to it. fact of the matter is, you have to be an intellect like Dr. Ram to make the distinction, by the way, and there are not many able to make the distinction today, and as a result, most of them end up as theistic evolutionists. That's what I find that many that are coming out, even of our so-called Christian schools today, are really holding this theistic evolution rather than this viewpoint here. Now, I'm going to consider it as we come here to Genesis, for we are going to turn there tonight. Here is a statement that he makes, and I'd like to read it. We believe Genesis 1-2 is not referring to ruin and destruction, but to vacancy awaiting informing. Now, informing means that the Holy Spirit worked from within and developed man from within, that God didn't form him from without, but that the Holy Spirit formed him from within. And of course, that viewpoint is the viewpoint that takes the position that the six days of Genesis are not 24-hour days, but that they are ends of periods of time that cover a long period of time. Now, I feel that it is a part of many intelligent men in attempting to hold an intellectual position with these men in the universities today that they take this viewpoint because they feel that it will enable them to meet the evolutionists and that they're able to answer the evolutionists. Certainly, they do have an interpretation for the gap theory because the minute that the evolutionist finds a gap, why, these folk come along and they say, well, that's where God stepped in and created. Well, the only difficulty with that is that we don't have scripture always for all of this matter of all the different gaps that are found. You can see it's a desperate attempt on the part of intelligent men today. I'm going over all of this again. Now we come to the fourth and the viewpoint that I hold, which is that of creation, the fiat creation that God spoke. And when God spoke, matter came into existence and that God brought into existence an original creation. Now, I do not think man was there. I do not think he was there in any form whatsoever. And that when you come to the six days, you come to a time of actually renovation, and when you come to the creation of man, he's something brand new. He's created ex nihilo, out of nothing. When God created man, he created him out of nothing. He breathed into his breathing places the breath of life, and man became a living soul. He became something new that had never been on this earth, never developed even on this earth before. Now, with that as a background, I'm wondering if in closing we can turn to the Genesis account. This is just to give you a sort of a brief background, because now we want to answer some questions, and the questions would be something like this. I think, frankly, that there are three questions that we want to know about the creation, and especially the creation of man. Who 
and when and why. Did you ever ask yourself the question, why you were created? Those are three questions that I think that any intelligent person ought to answer. And the interesting thing is, I believe God has given us a reasonable answer to it. Now, will you turn, if you have your Bible now, to Genesis 1-1, the very first verse of the Bible. Bereshi, bara, Elohim, a ha shemayim, wa a ha aretz. That's the original. That's the Hebrew of the first verse of Genesis. In the head, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, you could spend a week just talking about that verse. I had the privilege of sitting under Dr. Winchester of Canada, and I heard him speak for one whole month on the first chapter of Genesis, speaking every day, three days a week, for one entire period, 50 minutes. And he never got out of the first chapter of Genesis, and he apologized at the end of the series that he had not finished the first chapter. He said he'd hoped he'd been able to do it in one month. May I say to you that so much can be said about this. Now, in this one verse, you have all of the creation that God did until you get to the creation of animals as we know them today. There is evidence, abundant evidence, that there were animals that have disappeared, the dinosaurs. Now, they were in this original creation. They've disappeared off of this earth. That entire creation at that time disappeared. Now, did God have an intelligent creation on this earth? I do not know. I think he did. There seems to be evidence that there was an intelligent creation on this earth before man was ever put here. And all of that is in Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There is the creation. Now, when you get to the creation of animals and of whales and of fish, that's a separate creation. The reason I say that is that the Hebrew is very careful. Bereshit bara. Bara is the word for create. Malik is the word for make. And all the way through these six days, you have God made this in the first day and the second day. made light appear. He didn't create light. Light was already in his universe. He made it break through into this wreckage. And the thing that he created, and you do not find bara till you get to the creation of animals. Life, you see. Then when you come to the creation of man, bara is used again. So that there are three acts of creation in Genesis 1, and only three acts of creation. And it's very important. And they bridge these three gaps here, by the way. They bridge the gap. From nothing to the inorganic. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Matter. From inorganic to organic life. God created great whales. God created the animal. Life appears. Then from organic to man. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God created him. Male and female created he them. So that you have... There in Genesis, that bridge, that evolution cannot bridge. You have that in the book of Genesis in chapter 1 in the words create, you see. This is a reasonable explanation of the origin of things, my beloved. And may I say that I think it's God appealing to the intelligence of man. Now, something happened to this creation. Now, God didn't tell us. And it'd be mere speculation. I think I know, but it's speculation because God has not told us. And the earth was without form and void. Now, will you notice that? The earth became, that's the better translation, and the earth became tohu wabohu. Haaretz became tohu wabohu, without form and void. That means that it became the word is vain. It became useless. God created it perfect because he says in Isaiah, if you please, God says that he did not create this earth tohu wabohu. He didn't create it that way originally. It became that way. Why? I don't know. 
God didn't tell us. I believe that the fall of Satan, and we're going to take up the doctrine of Satan and of angels later on, and we'll discuss that. But I believe that that original fall is involved in the fall of Satan. Evidently, this earth and probably this entire galactic system was in the bailiwick of Satan. And when Satan went down in that original fall, everything that he had under him went down with it and his entire creation. The dinosaurs went out and whatever intelligent creation which here disappeared. We don't know anything about it. Now, why didn't God tell us? I think primarily it's none of our business. The second reason I think he didn't tell us is because he's attempting to give us here a book that though a man be a fool and a wayfaring man, he needn't err. He's giving us a way of salvation and not a book on geology or even origins, but he gives enough to appeal to the intelligence of man. So that what we have here, the earth became. Something happened to this earth. And it became without form and void. Now, into this picture, God moved. And when God moved into the picture, we find the Spirit of God brooding and the moved upon the face of the water. The picture is the picture of a mother hen getting the little chickens in under her. And the Spirit of God brooded on the face of the deep in that darkness. Now, will you notice the first thing that happened on the first day, God said... Let there be light, and there was light. God spoke and light. This stuff here, what is it? Candidly, they can't tell you much about light tonight. Have you ever seen Erwin Moon's demonstration? You can't quite know what light is. But God said, let there be light. In light, there is tremendous energy and sometimes heat. May I say that when God spoke, these things come into existence, the power of the Word of God. And that, may I say, that is the thing that answered the old nebula hypothesis. You remember years ago at the turn of the century? Why, listen, science at the turn of the century did contradict the Bible. And a great many theologians then tried to reconcile the nebula hypothesis with the Word of God. You can't, you couldn't do it then, and you can't reconcile evolution today. Let's wait. Twenty-five years, evolution will go out of style. It'll be another theory. And the reason they haven't taken another one is because another one hasn't come along. Evolution is wearing out today. They need a new one. Dr. Van Braun is developing space travel today. He says that space is revealing today a hand of a creator. And the interesting thing is, I think one of these days they're going to move into a pocket that's going to upset evolution and tear it to pieces, and you'll find another theory come along. And then you're trying to get me tonight to accept evolution? I'm waiting for the other one to come along, my friend. I want to hang on to it. I want the latest thing. And it'll be along in 25 years. Now... Nebula hypothesis said that matter is indestructible. (laughs) Therefore, Genesis is wrong. It says God spoke and this came into existence. That can't be. It's always been here. What do they do today with atomic fission? They take matter and translate it into energy and poof, it's gone. They reverse God's process. They did find out his secret. He took nothing and spoke and made energy into matter. And today man takes matter and takes it back out through energy, and that's atomic fission. Don't you see that that's upset man's theories? Let's wait till they get something permanent, something that's satisfactory today. That's the reason I'm not hanging on to evolution, nor am I hanging on to this other theory, progressive creationism. I'm not hanging on to these theories today, because I do not believe they're a satisfactory explanation. Now you have six days, actually, of renovation. And you will find that in these days, and I personally believe they're 24-hour days, and if you think they were longer periods, I won't fall out with you, 
that's all right. But I believe that they're 24-hour days. I can't understand what the evening and morning means unless it's a 24-hour day. They say it's the beginning of a period, then there was an evening of it, of going down, and then a morning of it coming back. Well, that's not what Genesis says. It's evening and morning was the first day, and I take it that that's a 24-hour day and that this is creation. But here, only two things appear. One is life, and the other is man. Now, what you have is God taking and beginning to make a place for man to live. And I, to me, that's the most wonderful thing in the world. He begins to separate. He divided the water above from the water beneath. There's water up above. They're out here on the desert. They've been getting a little of it from above. Flash floods. It flows up above us. The trouble of it is it flows over California and there's no leak in the pipe as it goes over us and it spills out out yonder on the desert in Arizona. I told Dr. Mitchell the other day, I said, you say you don't get any of the water from California, that we're taking it all out of the Colorado River. Well, I said, you're taking it away from us. We pipe it over here, over us here, and it goes, at least God does that. We don't do that. Even Governor Brown hasn't been able to do that and a lot of other things. But the thing is that we have here on the second day that God is dividing water above from water underneath. He's making air spaces here for man to live. He's preparing the way. And we're told that plant life appears. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together under one place. Let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, the gathering together of the waters called east seas. God saw that it was good. Now, do you notice he did not create plants? at this time. All they needed was for order to be brought and then they would come up again. Honestly, I've been across West Texas and I never believed that anything would ever grow around Sierra Blanca. I just didn't believe anything could grow there. It just rained. Needed something favorable for it to grow. Now, when this catastrophe came, all of life disappeared except plant life. But it couldn't grow. And now God begins to separate the waters from the waters, the water from the dry land. Dry land appears, then plant life begins to grow. And you have the development there. Then on the fourth day, the sun, moon, and stars become visible. He didn't create them. They had been there billions of years before. He made them come through. Then you find, though, Verse 21, God created great whales and every living creature that move it. There is creation, bara again. Then you have creation again, verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created him, male and female created he them. Why did God, or when did God do it? I do not know. How long ago? I do not know. Well, you've got a timetable here, haven't you? Dating 4004 B.C., it says. That's no good. Pitch that out. We do not know. No one knows about dating back this far back. You can't date any of this. When did God do it? I think he did it lots farther back than many of us here even tonight dream that he did. There's plenty of room in the genealogies to take man as far back as you need to take man back. Why did God do it? Well, I think several reasons that God did this. God did this because of the fact that it was for his glory. He created man for his glory. Man is going to make a contribution to God. I won't develop that tonight. God created man for his pleasure. You remember that yonder in the book of Revelation, when the redeemed gather, they praise him first as creator. Thou didst create us, and thou didst create us for thy pleasure. You know, God does not exist for our pleasure. We exist for his pleasure. He created us because he wanted to create us. The explanation is found in him, not in us. We think we're the center of this universe. We're not the center. The greatest blow man ever received when he found out this little earth was over in the side of the galactic system that we're in. We're just a side show. But we are there because we are there for the pleasure of God.